You know, I'm thinking about switching companies. <laughs> but I have a good comp plan. Things are really, really good. So tell me, why should I go with your company? Why should I go with you? Because we're the best. And the energy is real that we provide. Why should I go with you? Like she said, we are the best. We have the best people, the best company, the best energy. We're the best. Why should I go with you? We have the best people, the best product, and the best community. Okay, I want you three to come up on stage with me right now. Okay. Now, if I asked any of your competitors from other network marketing companies, if I asked them the same question, if I was a network marketer and you were trying to recruit me into your organization from another company, and I asked them the same question I asked you, why should I go with them? What do you think they would say? Probably the same. Ah, okay. <laughs> if I asked your competitors, anybody in this industry, the same question, why should I go with them? What do you think they would say? Probably the same thing that they said. Yeah. Mm. The energy, the people, mm. the product, mm. the quality. Okay. And if I asked your competitors the same question, why should I go with them? What do you think they would say? They would say that their product is the best, their people mm. are the best, and that you need what we have to offer. Mm. Okay. So what I think I heard all of you just say is that in your prospect's mind, you all sound the what? The same. You all sound the same. Could that be a problem for you? Yes. Okay. All right, now I want you guys to go sit down quick. Can I have the microphone back? Okay, now, let me start off asking you this question. If I asked you to describe the word sales or selling in one word, what would that word be? If I asked you to describe sales or selling in one word, what would that word be? Persuasion. Trust. Solutions. Value. Outstanding Relationship. relationships, lifestyle. Okay, I like all of that. There was a few others that are either our clients or have read something or followed me somewhere. So if I, what if we took all those words you just said, because I agree with you. What if we took every word you just said and we wrapped it into one word and that word was this, change. You see, all selling is, all sales, or about one thing only, and that's change. So whether your prospects are wanting something better or they're moving away from pain, it's all about change. So it's about how good you are at getting your prospects to view that in their mind, that by then changing their situation. Now for you, that means what? Purchasing what you're offering, starting the business with you, that by them doing that, that is far less risky for them than them doing nothing at all, staying in the status quo, their problems stay the same and nothing ever changes. Which is more risky? Now, here's your problem though. Human beings don't like change. Think of what I just said here. All selling is is change, yet human beings do not like change. And why do we not like change? Well, we especially do not like change when it's initiated by some pushy salesperson who's ready to pitch their solution quickly in the conversation. And repeatedly human behavior shows that we value something that is familiar to us, even if we don't like it that well, compared to something that is new, something that is foreign to us, something that is unknown. Now, raise your hand if you know anybody, friend, family, business associate, maybe even somebody in the room that just complains about their relationship to you all the time. Oh, my relationship is so bad. He or she is so horrible. And they complain to you about it all the time. Yet do you ever wonder 
why they stay in that relationship even though they don't like it that well? Well, why is that? Well, because we're a human being and we're afraid of change. See what I'm talking about? So that's pretty much what you're going up against with pretty much almost every single person you're talking to about your business, okay? Now, to some extent, now, how do we help them overcome the fear of change? It's quite easy once you, don't step by the speaker. It's quite easy once you learn how. So let's start here. We're gonna keep it basic. Realize this, you are not selling the thing. You're selling the results of what that thing does. Okay, in your industry, you're not selling them a water machine. You're selling them the results of what that does for them. You're selling them the results of what happens when they start the business with you. You're selling them having more time. You're selling them on being their own boss. You're selling them on making more money. That's what you're selling, the results of what your business actually does for them, not the thing itself. Are you with me on that? Yeah. All right, let's keep going here. Now, I wanna ask you this question. How are you going to have a competitive advantage over everyone else who's in your industry? There are tens of millions of people throughout the world that do the same thing you do. Do you realize that? You're not the only person, you're not the only company, right? Everybody else thinks they're the what? The number one, the best, they have the best this, they have the best that, they have the best quality, they have the best people, they have the best founders, they have the best whatever. They all say the same thing. So how do you stick out in your prospect's mind, okay? So here's my suggestion on how you can do that. The ones who will own, when I say this upcoming market, I mean the next year, two years, five years, 10 years, the ones who will excel, the ones who will make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if not millions a year, are simply the ones that know how to do this. The ones who know what to say and ask that will cause their prospects to want to open up, to want to engage, instead of trying to get rid of you. That's simply what it will take, okay? So what's gonna give you that competitive advantage? What's gonna cause you to stick out in your prospect's mind? The next three things are. So today I'm gonna to show you this. We're gonna break down each one. We got a lot of time. Usually in keynotes I have like 65 minutes or 90 minutes, I'm gonna throw everything out. I think we're here for six hours. Okay. So we're gonna slow down. Okay, seven hours, okay. I gotta catch my flight tonight. All right, so today we're gonna to go over three steps to becoming the trusted authority in your prospect's mind. Trusted authority, trusted expert. How do you do that? Hold it, all right, number one. Becoming a problem finder and problem solver, not a product pusher. Product pushers do not do very well in our day and age, especially in your industry. You will have to play the numbers game and go through a lot of rejection, and I'm just too lazy for that. I'd rather not do that. Number two, asking the right questions, but at the right time in the conversation, and especially with the right tone. You see, your tone is how your prospect interprets the intention behind everything you say. Your tone is how your prospect interprets the meaning behind the questions you're asking. There are certain questions that you're gonna to have to ask that require more of a curious tone. Uh, what, what do you do for work? What do you do, what do, you do for a living? That's a curious tone. There's other questions that require more of a, a confused tone. Uh, John, hold on, I'm not, I'm not understanding. Why did, they, why did they cut your pay? See, that's a confused tone. There's other questions that require more of a skeptical or challenging tone. What are the consequences if you don't do anything about this? See, that's a challenging tone. There's other questions that require more of a concerned tone, a tone that shows more empathy. 
Sally, what's, what's really holding you back from moving forward so you can make more money? See, that's a concern to them. And then third is eliminating sales resistance. How do we eliminate sales resistance to get the prospect to let their guard down and emotionally open up and tell us what's really going on? All right. Now, what I'm going to do, whoa, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. Yes, that is an old picture. It's like 22 years ago. See how that's all faded and everything? They had like, like cameras back then or something. I don't know if the phones even took pictures back then. So I'm going to go over a little bit of my background because my background relates to what is necessary if you want to take your income and your persuasion and sales ability to a level that most people only dream of. So I got started in selling 22 years ago, broke, burned out, college student, and I got my first job selling home security systems door to door. Raise your hand if you ever sold anything door to door. I know my people now. Okay, let me zone in on you, okay. And basically the company, most door to door companies, they hire you, it's straight commission, they pretty much hire everybody, they give you a script, they give you a couple books by the sales gurus, and they drive you out in a van, let me know if you've ever experienced this, in door to door, they drive you out in a van and they basically like kick you out of the van, and they're like, hey, go make some sales, it's gonna be easy, we'll pick you up after dark. And I'm like, I'm a 21 year old kid, and I still remember, the last one dropped off in that van. I still remember looking back at my sales manager. His name was Xane. The crazy name. He's like a surfer guy from California. This crazy, like, curly blonde hair. And he's like, yo, dude, remember, when you knock on the door, show them how excited you are about the product. Show them that you believe in the product and that you are excited, be enthusiastic, and they're going to be excited. They're going to believe it if you show them your belief in it. I'm like, that makes complete sense. If I show them I'm excited about it, if I show them that I believe in it, then somehow they're magically going to believe in it too. And so I started knocking on the, I started knocking on the doors, you know? And I was all excited and I was talking about my features and my benefits and how it was the best this and we were the number one this and we were the local company who had the best quality and the best service and we had a triple A rating with the better business but I was really excited and I started noticing from the very first door that I was getting all these objections. What? They didn't tell me about all that. We don't need it. We can't afford it. Your price is too high. We've already talked with somebody about this. I need to talk to my spouse. I need to do more research. I need to think it over. Can you leave me information? I'm really interested. I'll call you back in a week, a month, a year later. Raise your hand if you've ever lost sales to any of those. A few of you back there have not lost any sales. That's remarkable back there. And I finally got to a point after about seven to, geez, eight weeks of hell, of going through that nonstop rejection, I finally got to a point where I'm like, this is not very fun. And I remember one late Friday evening about to be picked up from the sales manager. I remember standing there on the curb, sweat rolling down my chest. You're talking like end of July, early, like end of June, early July heat, sweat rolling down your chest, your back. If you've ever sold door to door after like 12 hour days, your legs are what? Jello, like they're toast, like your legs are, I still remember like rubbing my foot on the hot concrete. If you've ever sold door to door, you, you know, that's an inside story. And I had worked 12 hours that day and made zero sales. So when you make zero sales and you're door to door in a straight commission, that means what? Zero oh, zero dollars. Oh, no good. In fact, that entire week, I'd worked 60 plus hours and made zero sales, zero dollars. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm feeling pretty defeated as a human being. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe selling, maybe selling just wasn't for me. Have you ever felt that way yourself? Yeah. Have you ever like looked into your bank account and notice you had more going out than you had coming in? Well, that's where I was at, completely desperate. And when my manager picked me up that day, 
he popped in a Tony Robbins CD. Yes, 22 years ago, people listened to those like round things <laughs> called the CDs. You know, you plug it, it's just really a miracle. And Tony said something like this. He said this. I could be butchering it, Tony, if you're listening. But he said, you will fail for the simple reason you don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed. You will fail if you don't learn the right skills necessary to succeed. Now he went on to say that everybody is pretty much taught skills. But he said the people who do not do as well, who don't succeed, are the ones who are not taught the right ones. And he goes on to say that there are differences in skill level. And for the first time in my 21-year-old life, I was thinking, oh, I, I never knew that some skills maybe were far more effective than others. That maybe what the company was training me and what I was learning from what I called the old sales gurus, no pun intended, maybe they just weren't the right skills anymore. Maybe they're outdated. Maybe they didn't just work as well. So I committed to myself that I'm going to, well, I'm going to have to learn how to do this. I'm going to have to develop. I'm going to have to learn the right skills. Because I know you, like me, want to provide a great lifestyle for your family as well. Is that the reason why you're here? Okay. Now, at the same time this is going on, same time I was using traditional selling skills. So, you know, from the gurus, from the, the company, what they were training me, and I would notice there was this major dilemma going on in mind, because I noticed when I would use some of the things they were training, that they would work. And I would make some sales. But I also noticed a lot of times I used some of the things they were saying, I would actually lose a ton of deals. I noticed when I would say certain things, and I would be more assumptive, especially in the beginning, it was like my prospects would like close down. And I'd get more objections. And I'd have to chase and I'd have to follow up with them all of the time. And it was almost like I was begging them to solve their problems with my solution. It was like I, I noticed that when I would ask questions, they would give me vague, generalized, surface level answers. Raise your hand if you've ever noticed that. Now, at the same time this was going on, I was in college and I was majoring in behavioral science and human psychology. And I'm not gonna give you the scientific mumbo jumbo, you might get bored. But really, behavioral science is the study of the brain and how we make decisions. Why does the brain say yes instead of saying no? Why does it look at a sign that says go left and actually go left? Like what triggers that to actually happen? Now, my behavioral science professors, while I was in school, they were saying that the most persuasive way to communicate was over here. Now, one of, my, uh, one of my professors was by the name of Robert Caldini. Anybody ever heard of Robert Caldini? I know Colton, we were talking about it. Okay, he's head of behavioral science at Arizona State University. Uh, wrote uh, Presuasion, Power of Influence, some of those great books. And also other professors that I was learning from, they were saying that the most effective way to communicate was here. Now the sales gurus and their training programs, they were saying it was here, I'm talking exact opposite. So like there's this thing of like, what should I do? I don't know who to believe, like what's going on? So I'm like, how do I take what I'm learning from how the brain makes decisions, human behavior, <laughs> psychology, social dynamics, how do I take that and bring that into a step-by-step -step sales structure? Because that didn't exist at that time. How do I learn the right questions to ask? So what I started to do was started to learn how to develop questions and techniques that worked with human behavior. How do I use my tone to get them to let their guard down? How do I get them to do all the work? Instead of traditional selling, you've got to do all the work, right? How do I get the prospect to sell themselves? Whereas traditional selling, you've got to sell them. How do I get them to persuade themselves? How do I get them to overcome their own objections? How do I get them to pull me in rather than push and pressure? And overnight, selling became very, very easy and exceptionally profitable. Now, why did I just tell you 
my story and background. Because none of you care about that. You're a human, right? We all are. That's just human behavior 101. Who do you care about? You care about yourself, right? But why did I tell you all that? Because I want you to imagine me four years from that date that I was on getting into that van, about to quit. Four years later from that very time, I was making multiple seven figures a year in commissions. Four years later. Four years before, I almost quit all because of what? Because I had not learned the right skills. Now I went on to do that in four completely different industries, one of them in your industry. So I know your industry fairly well. Yes. You see, I am not anyone famous. In fact, I'm a lot like you. I'm just simply a person who decided very early on that if I wanted to have an amazing lifestyle for my future family, that I was not going to be able to do what everyone else was doing. I was not going to be able to stay in the status quo. If I wanted to sell a lot more, I couldn't sell like everybody else was with traditional selling skills. I was going to have to learn a much more advanced way of selling to get a much better result. You see, unfortunately for me, I was not born out of my mother's womb with advanced questioning skills. Raise your hand if you're born out of your mother's womb with advanced questioning skills. Oh, just this one guy here, two. Okay. You see, oh, three. See, I would, oh, four, five. Oh, wow. You definitely had advantage over me. I wasn't born out of my mother's womb with advanced tonality skills. And I for sure was not born out of my mother's womb with advanced objection prevention and handling skills. I had to acquire those skills. I had to learn those skills. So if a kid who grew up in the middle of Missouri on a cattle ranch outside of a town with less than 800 people in it can acquire those skills, what does it mean for you? It means you can do the exact same thing. You can make two, three, five, ten, twenty, fifty, one hundred times what you are currently making now. Yes. You guys are okay with that? Yes. All right. So when somebody says that salespeople are born, we all know now that that's what? A myth. No one is born with any of those skills. We have to acquire those skills. Okay, let's move on. Now, how do we do that? It's all talk, it's all dreaming, until we do what? We acquire the skills. Now, step number one. Becoming a, now, I have to warn you, I have dry eye syndrome, so my puncture plugs are closed. So if I'm tearing up, I could be crying, but more than likely, I have puncture plugs in my own, in my, so. I always have to warn anybody when I speak, if I'm crying, I mean, it could be, but there you go. All right, becoming a problem finder, problem solver, not a product pusher. Now, raise your hand if the prospects you talk to have problems and or emotional needs. Raise your hand. Everybody better be raising their freaking hand. You see, there's never been a product or service ever invented in the history of mankind that does not solve a problem and or an emotional need. Your industry does both. You have an advantage. Now, if I buy a $500,000 Ferrari, does that really solve a problem? Eh, I mean, if I'm a race car driver, maybe. But it doesn't really, like if I want to go from point A to point B, I can drive a 2012 Honda Accord, right? But that car probably does what? Solves an emotional need. 
Maybe when I was a kid, I was, maybe I was bullied and now I'm really successful and I wanna show my high school classmates 25 years later that I've arrived, that I'm successful. I'm solving emotional need. Maybe my dad said I wouldn't amount anything, so now I'm gonna show him, I'm gonna have a really nice car. Maybe I wanna impress my neighbors that I drive through. See, I'm solving an emotional need. Everything that has ever been sold solves a problem and or an emotional need. So here's what I'm gonna have you do. On a pen, grab a pen and a piece of paper. I'm gonna give you 35 seconds, not a second more. And I want you to write down the two biggest problems, write down the two biggest problems that you solve. That could be through your product or your business. Write down the two biggest problems that your products and services solve. You might wanna all write that down because I'm gonna come ask some of you. Write down the two biggest problems that you solve with the business or your products. Somebody raise their hand that's already written that down. Right there, yeah. Health and finances. Health and finances, okay. Uh, yellow. Money and time. Money and time, yes, you? Uh, dream, vision, and mission bigger than the life that they're living and looking for a sense of belonging and support as an entrepreneur. Valid, okay, yes. Okay, good. Those are all problems, emotional needs that you solve. Now, here's my suggestion as someone coming from your industry that did fairly decent, made a few dollars. The two biggest problems that you really solve that you probably want to focus on if you want to build big organizations and help a lot of people is a lack of money and a lack of time. Those are the two biggest problems that you solve. Lack of money, lack of time. Now, how many people do you even know in your own circle of influence or business associates or people walking down the street or neighbors or anybody that want to make more money or have more time with their families? Okay. See, everybody in the world is a potential customer for you when you start viewing it from a different viewpoint. Everybody in the world, except maybe about the 900 some billionaires, want to make more money. Well, actually they want to make more money and they want to have more time, okay? Those are the two biggest problems that you solve. Now, here's what I'm gonna ask you. Look at the two problems you just wrote down. Raise your hand if your solution solves those. Everybody should be raising their hand. I can see you if you're not, I'll probably come to you. But I have vision all over the place. All right, so here's, here's, what I, here's what I feel you're saying to yourself. Your prospects have problems and your solution solves those. So if your prospects have problems and your solution solves those, why are they not buying from you? What's the missing link? They have problems. They want to make more money. They want to have more time. Your solution solves those. Why are they running the other way? Can I make a suggestion to you? Okay. Okay. Here's what I'm going to suggest to you. It's not the people you're talking to. It's not the leads. Even though a lot of you think it is, oh, my leads are broke. They have such a limited, limiting belief. They just have a fear. Oh, everybody I talk to is broke. <laughs> it's not your mindset. Even though some of you believe it is. Can I say something that might sound really harsh right now? Okay, I'm just being real with you. Because if I'm not real with you, I'm, I can't really help you. It's not that you don't have a great mindset or that you don't journal enough or you don't take enough cold showers or you don't meditate enough. Even though I love those things, none of those things are going to help you communicate to your prospects. It's not that you don't even read enough personal development, even though I love personal development. Because when the prospect says hello, if you don't know what to say, if you don't know what to ask, if you don't know how to use your tone, 
you're going to get slapped in the face very, very quickly. And all that personal development is going to go out the window extremely fast. Even though I love personal development, it's not going to help you sell more. It's not that you're not motivated enough. You're all motivated. You came here. That tells me and you what? That you're serious about changing your situation. Otherwise, otherwise you'd be at home watching football or you know, doing something else, shopping. And it's damn well that you don't work hard enough. Raise your hand if you work hard. Raise your hand if you work hard. See, you all work hard. I know lots of people in this industry that work their butts off that are still making no, hardly any money. So if it's none of those things, what on earth could it actually be? Now before I suggest to you what it could be, I wanna ask you this question. Raise your hand if you wanna triple the amount of sales you made last year and or triple the amount of people you bring into your organization and business. Raise your hand. Even if you're starting out and you're brand new and you're like, as a brand new person, you haven't even done anything, but you want to triple what the average brand new person is, raise your hand. Now, keep your hand raised if you can triple the amount of hours you're working right now. Keep your hand raised if you can triple the amount of hours you're working now. You already work eight to 10 hours a day. You're gonna work 16 to 24 to, well, you can't go past 24. You're gonna work 16 to 24 hours a day? Come on, let's be real. You can't, you, that's not gonna last even if you try, right? So if it's none of those things, what is it? It's this. If you want to triple your sales, if you wanna triple the amount of people you bring into your organization and then show them how to actually be successful and duplicate, you have to what? you're gonna to have to acquire a much higher level of sales ability than you currently possess today. Right? Okay. Now, it's what you're saying. It's what you're not asking. It's words you're using that's triggering sales resistance. That's once you learn how to tweak those words and how to use your tone, everything can open up for you. And that's what we're gonna focus on throughout this day. Now, I'm gonna ask you this question as well. Who in here, raise your hand if you like to read books. Raise your hand if you're a reader, okay. Or you listen to books on audio, maybe you drive around your car. That's what a lot of us do, right? The first sales seminar that I ever went to was by a, a, a guy by the name of Brian Tracy. Raise your hand if you ever heard of Brian Tracy, yeah? Good friend of mine. Um, first seminar I ever went to after that dreadful summer. Okay, first sales seminar I went to. And Brian said something that stuck in my brain ever since. <coughs> Brian said this. He said, use your vehicle as a university on wheels. And from that, when I, when I saw him standing on this type of stage in Salt Lake City, Utah, in September of 2001, yes, I'm that old, when I was in school, <laughs> that changed my entire direction. From that moment on, I turned the radio off mm -hmm. and I started listening or reading to five books a month times 12 months a year. That's 60 books a year on sales, persuasion, and influence times the past 22 years. If I did my math right, that's 1,360 some books. Now, a lot of people ask me, Jeremy, how do you have time to read five books a month? I don't. I typically listen to three, and I typically read to two. Now, where do I listen to three? Well, there's a thing called a car that you drive around. So instead of listening to Taylor Swift, even though I love you, Taylor, or listen to your favorite songs, maybe you're into heavy metal or country or rap or whatever you listen to, or how many of you listen to politics or the news? Because, how many of those things you listen to right now in your car, how many of those things I just listed make you money? Zero. None of them make you a dime. And look at all the time you're wasting. 
three minutes here, five minutes here, <coughs> 10 minutes to the grocery store, seven minutes to church, seven minutes back to church, 10 minutes to pick up your kid, 10 minutes to come back home, 10 minutes to work. There's an hour and a half probably a day that you could acquire the skills. And some of you say you don't have time. Probably not this group though. Now, in every single book I've ever read, or you've probably ever read, there's usually two things it says. It usually says, always be closing, ABCs of closing. That's kind of a given that most of them book. And it also says you have to be a problem solver. And I agree with that. But as I really started to think about what problem solving meant, problem solving does not happen until after they purchase. You can't be a problem solver if they don't buy your product or start the business with you, right? How can you be a problem solver if they don't purchase from you? You can't. You see, problem solving happens after they buy, after they have the machine, after they start the business with you and you're training them what to do for your industry. So if you want to bring a lot more people in than you are, if you want to make a lot more sales, you have to become much better at this. This is what's called problem finding. Now, what does problem finding actually mean? Problem finding is asking the right questions at the right time in that conversation to get the prospect to see and feel that they have many more problems than they originally thought they had. Now, when you first start talking with a potential customer or prospect, most of them don't know what, that they really even have a problem. Am I right? Yeah. If you start talking to them about your machines, I'm assuming, I'm gonna go out on a limb, that they don't sit around on Sunday afternoons really diving into like how bad the water is that they drink. Just gonna go out on a limb on that, okay? They might say they wanna make more money or have more time, but they don't really sit around having some plan about how they're gonna do that, right? Am I right on that, okay? So if we can't get them to understand that, so we have to help them see that they have many other problems, challenges they didn't, didn't know they have, okay? Now, when we do that, when we're able to help uncover problems in their mind that they didn't know, because most of your prospects probably know they have a problem, especially making money and have time, but they don't really know what, how bad that problem really is. They don't understand the depth of that problem. They don't understand the consequences of what happens if they don't do anything about solving that problem. Now, through learning, and we're gonna, we're here all day, through learning advanced questioning, and probing and tonality and body language, that allows the prospect to start seeing many other issues and problems they had never really internalized themselves. That causes them to build urgency in their mind that they want to, where's that word again? Change, okay? All right, let's keep moving on. Let's slow this down a little bit. Now, what are most salespeople? and distributors. Unfortunately, most sales and distributors are this. <sighs> Am I right? I mean, let's be real. Some of you don't believe you're this, and it's not your fault that you were maybe trained this, but it is your what? It is your problem. It's not your fault, but it is your problem. And nobody's gonna save you but who? Yourself. Nobody is coming to save you. Okay, now, what are most salespeople or distributors in your industry trained to do? If I, well, let me ask you this. I've got, a, I've got a dandy for you. It's all coming back to me now. It's like riding a bike. If I'm driving down the road and I'm with my friend and my friend says, oh, God, I hate my job. It freaking sucks company just went through a merger, I might get fired, they're just not paying me that much, so sick of this, like, I never get to see little Susie, you know, piano recital, I never get to see Johnny playing soccer. Your friend says that, and then what do you say? Just be real, just be real, what do you say? Oh, that sucks, you know what? I just started this amazing opportunity, it is so so awesome like I know some people that are making so much money and they work from home in fact we have this machine it's like this uh, machine that like gets rid of disease and like we get to you know drink the water and like oh the water is so bad for you in fact like when I found out about the water it was like oh my gosh I can't believe the water 
like uh, just the plastic water and, and everything. And like, you know what? There's a webinar tonight. You should definitely come. It's so cool. Like they're gonna go over like the, how bad the water really is that you're drinking and it causes all the disease. And they're gonna go over like this income opportunity. And in fact, my mentor, she's making $60,000 a month. That is so insane. It's so awesome. So I'm gonna email it to you. And then after you go through it, um, will you call me and I'll, I'll take you through the details and how to sign up? Is that, you do something like that? Oh. Product pusher. And then your friend says what? Oh, yeah, I'm really busy tonight. Like, yeah, I, you know, is it, is it, does it cost money? Is it one of those like MLM type of things? It was my aunt, she started one of those sayings a couple years ago. She lost all of her money, like a pyramid scheme, and she got scammed, so I just don't have the money, but thanks so much. <laughs> and then you're left like, she had the problem. Your solution solves those problems. What was the missing link? What you're saying. What you're not understanding how to ask. How to get them to emotionally open up and relive the pain before you go into your pitch. That's what caused her to run the other way, even though she has problems that you really can help. And that's the sad thing. See where we're at here? This is real life. If we can't help somebody overcome the fear of change, who is that on, them or us? Wow. It's on us. And the moment you start taking responsibility, if you don't bring somebody in that you started talking to, like, and you start thinking, like, what did I say? What did I, what did I not ask? Like, ah, was, I, was I too fast to jump in? And you start to internalize it, rather than saying, just a numbers game. Just talk to as many people, just gotta get as many. What's the saying in network marketing? Uh, with the no's to get to the yes, what is it? No, go for no. What is, what's the other one? No, get closer to the yes. There's other ones, the cliches. Uh, well, I know what you're talking about, but there's, there's the other ones. It's like, oh, it's like, uh, no, so what? Who cares? What's, well, what is it? Somebody stand up. What is it? Some will, some won't. Who cares? Yeah. And that's exactly why you're not where you're at financially. Sounds really cool. It's a cool cliche, but it's not really helping you, is it? Nope. Unless you really love playing the numbers game. What if we worked on and started playing the skills game? What if we focused on every word we're saying, every question we're asking and not asking, and how to use our tone, and we focused on every the quality of every conversation we're having. Do you ever watch any movies or, has anybody ever watched like the NBA? You know, like Steph Curry, anybody know Steph Curry? Everybody heard of Michael Jordan, all those, LeBron, Tom Brady. Can you imagine Steph Curry? He's like the three point guy, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Can you imagine, can I set this here? Is that like vodka or what is that? Yeah. Good Lord, jeez, what's going on up here? This is a VIP table, apparently. I like that. Can you imagine if Steph Curry said that basketball was a numbers game? Oh, just shoot as many threes as you can. I mean, eventually you'll hit one out of 25. Just a numbers game. Just keep shooting it. You'll eventually hit one. Would Steph Curry be in the NBA? No, he would have never made his high school team. See, Steph Curry knows that basketball is a skills game. So he's focused on his technique every day. He's practicing his hand motions, his dribbling, right? His legs, his, his hips, how he gets open, his movement, his wrist. And that's why he's become the best, because he's focused on the skill game, whereas so many of you are still focused on the numbers game. Mm, that's so good. Can I help you with that? Okay, all right. Now, let's keep going. Let's keep moving on. And here's what I, oh. I have to say this. Some of you might get angry. So when we go through what I just did out there with all that stuff, when you're talking to your friend, we get all this stuff, right? We're all excited, enthusiastic. We have the best this, we have the best that. That is the equivalent of like this, taking a bucket of mud, 
throwing it up against the wall and hoping and praying that something you just said in that two minute, whatever that was called, is gonna magically cause that person to wanna to buy from you and be interested from you. We call that hopium. It's a drug. It's a drug that so many entrepreneurs, distributors, salespeople take where you hope and pray something you're gonna show them in that webinar is gonna match that you're inviting them to because the webinar does the selling for you. It's gonna magically cause them to wanna to buy. You'll get the laydowns, but you're missing the other 98% that still have the same problems and the same challenges that you could help as well. Don't do drugs. If you wanna be a top 1% earner in this industry, drugs are not good for you. Don't take the hopium drug anymore. That is a hard way, it's unpredictable. There's no way you can make a living in this industry or any industry for that matter, taking the hopium drug. Okay, let's go to step number two. Here we go. All right, step number two, asking the right questions at the right time. Now remember, let's go back. So remember I was in college, remember I was majoring in behavioral science, human psychology, the study of the brain, how human beings make decisions. So check this out. According to behavioral science, there are three forms of communication. I think I even wrote about these in that book. Three forms of communication. I would suggest that you write these down because once you understand the differences in persuasion and where you currently are, even if you're doing well, compared to where you could be, it will completely change everything for you and your team. Now, I'm going to ask you this question as well. If I Let's do this. If I said the words, boiler room selling, what's the first image that comes to your mind right now? Boiler room selling, what's the first image that comes to your mind? Somebody stand up, what's the first image that comes to your mind when I say boiler room selling? What's that? I don't know him personally, but Wolf on Wall Street, right? Something like this. Is it like this? Hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. We talk about our features and benefits and the opportunity and why they need to go with us. And then we push and pressure and try to make them go with us because we've got the best this, the best that, right? That's just like when you tell your spouse, your partner, or your kids that they really, really need to do something. Then you push and pressure them. What do they typically do back? Oh, they push back. See, that's just human behavior 101. So if they're pushing back, why would you expect your prospects not to push back? If pushy salespeople push you and you push back, why would you not expect them to push back when you're doing the same thing? Oh, okay, we're starting to think a little bit now. Okay, now, first mode. So we are the least persuasive when we tell people things. So according to the data, pesky data, we're the least persuasive when we tell people things, when we attempt to dominate them, when we manipulate them, when we posture them, when we push and pressure them, we are the least persuasive. Hence, sales is a numbers game because we are causing it to be a numbers game by the way we communicate. Now, I'm going to show you a few examples of the least persuasive way to sell according to the science. Presenting. We've all been taught that you have to have an amazing presentation, which you do, you have to have a presentation. We talk about, oh, here's our, we pull up our slides or there's some type of webinar we show them and here's a picture of our corporate offices and our cool building and here's a picture of our founders, they have the most integrity, I've heard that one so many times. Here's a picture of like our products are so awesome. Here's a picture of our JD Power and Customer Service Awards. Here's our triple A rating with the Better Business Bureau. We have the best this, we have the best that, which by the way, doesn't every single salesperson or distributor in this industry say that they have the number one product, number one service, represent the number one company? Anybody ever heard of that? Oh, oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Now, just so you know, psychologically, when you say things like that, your prospects actually trust you less, especially if you talk down about your competition. Do you know why? Do you know why? I almost fell over that. Because they are used to every single person that's ever tried to sell them saying the same thing. How many salespeople or distributors you talk to says, yeah, we're the sixth best in the market. <laughs> 
Nobody. Right? Anybody ever watch like The Bachelor or Bachelorette? Oh, guilty. Oh, guilty. It's okay. You know, what do they always say when the host comes out? The, the host comes out, they're like, this is the most dramatic, the most exciting season ever. And you're like, that's so awkward because they said that for 23 years straight. So I don't really believe them anymore. See, you don't believe them when they say that, do you? Yeah. Ah. Okay. Now, that doesn't mean you go and say we suck or anything. There's obviously some, some fine line. So when we're presenting, we still have to have a presentation, but we typically do not want the presentation to be more than 10% of your entire sales conversation. And that's a major issue because on average in any industry, we train 158 different industries at seventh level, yours being one of those. The average person in all those industries presents about half the time. Your industry, even worse. Just being real, it's about 70% of the time. You are talking 70% of the time about your thing, okay? That's number one. So we wanna get that down to about 10%, which we're gonna go over later when we go more into the workshop. Telling your story. I hate to tell you this, when you're selling one-to-one, -one, nobody cares about their story. Whose story do they care about? Yeah. Oh, their story, I can't imagine. What about putting sales pressure on them? A lot of you don't think you're doing that, but what's really going on in their mind, right? See, there is a massive difference, and we're gonna talk about this later today when we go through the scripting. There's a massive difference in getting your prospects to feel so much internal tension, internal tension about their problems, building a gap from where they are to where they want to be, feeling that internal tension, then putting external sales pressure and pushing them. Now, internal tension can only happen by one of two things. Either they're a lay down, like Brian says, every blind squirrel eventually finds a nut, and they're gonna buy from you no matter who you are. You can't even talk if they're gonna sign up. There's that one person out there. You know what I mean? The one or two a year you're getting? Okay, that's, that's that. Or your questioning ability and your tone helps build that internal tension. We're gonna talk about that, okay? And remember, what is the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change? Pain or the fear of future pain? That's what causes a human being to want to change. There's that word again, change. So if we can't help them relive pain or see or feel the future pain, there's no urgency for them to want to change. See where we're going with this? All right. And then another one. Here's the big one. Assuming the sale, especially early in the conversation. And that's exactly why, not all, but most of probably the sales training you've gone through says that sales is a numbers game. Right? And I always thought, okay, sales is a numbers game. You gotta call more leads, you gotta work more, you gotta work harder, you know, just get more no's, it's gonna lead to the yes. How does that give you any competitive advantage over anybody else? You're just gonna work harder and somehow you're gonna make it? Basically, what that sales trainer just told you is, what I'm training you doesn't really work that well, so unfortunately for you, you're just gonna have to work harder and just call more leads. That's not very nice of them. I don't want to to work three times as many hours, right? All right, now it's exactly why we trigger what's called fight or flight mode. And we're gonna talk about that later today. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of fight or flight mode. Ah, raise your hand if you know how it's triggered in the brain. More than likely, most of you probably don't know that unless you have a background in psychology, okay? All right, and error number two, cons uh, consultative selling. So consultative selling, the second mode of selling came out 70s, early 80s with books like Spin Selling, Neil Rackham, uh, Sandler Institute, um, and they taught, and Neil Rackham, college professor, never sold anything by the way, but they taught that you needed to ask questions or logical based questions to find the needs of the client. But what's a potential downfall of only asking logical based questions? What type of answers are our prospects going to give us in return? Logical based surface level answers. And do human beings buy on logic or emotion? emotion? Emotion. So more persuasive than the first mode of telling your story, putting sales pressure on them, close, 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 close. 
but we're still having to play the numbers game because we're bringing out very little emotion in the actual prospect. And that's why I always say you can never sell to just the needs of the client. Oh, that's blasphemy, Jeremy. You can never, let me repeat that. You can never sell to just the needs of the client. Do you know why? Because most of your prospects when you first start talking to them don't even know what they need when you first start talking to them. Can I give you an example of this? Because some of you, that's, I, dare me, I don't know about that. I, I hear everything else you're saying, but I don't, I don't know. I'm in sales, I gotta sell to the needs. Let's say that you wake up tomorrow morning. Now this is just for illustrative purposes, not gonna happen to any of you. You wake up tomorrow morning and like, oh my God, I have such a bad headache. My head hurts so bad. I've got a bad migraine. I need to go to urgent care. I need to get some medication because that's what you think you need. So you, you're like, okay, the, the copay, my insurance, my budget's gonna be $100. I've got a $100 budget. You go into urgent care and the doctor, she starts to ask you some questions about the pain and where the pain is in your head and how long you've had the pain and what the pain feels like and what the pain's preventing you from being able to do and other pointed questions. And now suddenly her questions start to get you to feel internally you might have a much bigger problem than you originally thought you had. She then suggests that you need to go do a CAT scan and the CAT scan comes back that you have a tumor. Not only that, it is a terminal tumor and you have two weeks to live. Now, the solution to solve that is to do surgery and remove that tumor and that's a $2 million surgery. Your insurance is gonna cover 90%. You got a really good plan. That leaves you with a budget now of $200,000 to solve that problem. Well, the hell with the $100 budget. You thought that's what you needed. But now you know what you need because of the doctor getting you to internalize what your real problems are. Because if you would have went into that doctor and said, I got the pain in the head, she's like, oh, here you go, here's some medication, you wouldn't be alive two weeks later because she was selling to what you thought you needed. Instead, her questions allowed her to be able to sell to what the real problems were. Never sell to needs, sell to what your questions help you and them find what their real problems are. See the difference in what we're talking about? These are massive differences that take you from here to making seven figures or more in your business every single year. All right, now let's keep moving on. Can I show you some questions? I see lots of scripts. So we, we train every industry, including yours. We have global sales trainers all over the world. We see all these scripts all the time. To come into our offices. Now, can I show you a few? Now, okay, here's, here's my concern in doing this. Can I, can I tell you my concern? Okay. Okay. I'm concerned for you that if I show you some surface level questions and then show you what they're really doing in the prospect's brain, that it's really gonna screw you up tomorrow when you start talking to prospects again. Okay? So we have to decide here which direction we're gonna go. Now some of these are from you guys, so I paid attention. And these actually are not bad, okay? From, I've seen a lot of network marketing scripts, I promise you, these are not bad, they're pretty good but I can show you how to make them a lot better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay? Because my concern is you're gonna be like really screwed up because you thought they're really working well, maybe not so well. So we have to decide, are we gonna, you know, are we gonna keep taking the blue pill over here or are we gonna take the red pill? Because okay. once you start to take the red pill, it, you can't really go, it's hard to go back. Or, or we can just stay, you know, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Sales is a numbers game. I hope and pray it's gonna work out one day down the road. I'll find this perfect, you know, person and they're gonna recruit everybody for me and I'm gonna make all this money and get rich. We can keep taking the blue pill or we can take the red pill and take control. You sure? Okay. I gave you a warning. All right. Now. 
not bad. So some of you do reels, right? Some of you do reels, and I would do that if I was in network marketing. I was in network marketing for, I think from late 2009 to like middle of 2014, end of 2014, about four and a half, five years. I wasn't really on social media, did a little bit differently, but if I was, I would definitely do reels now. I would definitely build a brand for sure, 100%. So a lot of you, when you get into the DMs, when they make comments, you say this question, right? Hey, were you looking for more information on the water or were you just being supportive? I'm being supportive, I kind of like that. But here's my suggestion. When you ask them, were you looking for more information, what type of way of thinking has I automatically put them in? Logical-based information thinking. Just by saying that, are you looking for more information? They say yes. You send the information, you most of the time never hear back from them. Am I right? Because you put them in information-based thinking, okay? So, how many of you, when you do that, now you get some people, they're like, oh yeah, I'm really interested. Those are the, more the laydowns. See, you can already sell to laydowns. I don't need to be here for that. I don't need to train you. You don't need to go through our, our client training programs, anything, if you're okay with just selling to the laydowns. I'm more interested in helping you sell to the other 97% of your prospects that you're struggling with right now, okay? Because that's what I learned how to do, and I learned how to teach people how to do that. So this is why your prospects say to you, even after you give them the information, do you notice what objections you get? I need to do more research. I need to keep looking at this. Um, I need to think it over. I need to talk to my spouse about it. Or can you send me more information? Raise your hand if you still get those objections even after you do this. Ah, okay. All right, now we're, now we're starting to go somewhere. So, here is how I would rather re-language this. Let me try to get my tone going here. Can I ask a favor? Um, is there any like, can I have like two chairs in the very back brought up here on the stage? So when I do some of this, I actually get into like role play mode rather than like training mode. It's a little bit different. Maybe two chairs that nobody's setting in the very back. <laughs> so I might change it to a little bit of this. Now, let me help you with, well actually you're in the DMs, but if you were on the phone, I would show you the tone. Hey, I saw you uh, comment on that post I did about the differences in water and how blank water can help eliminate blank. So I'm going to take that as a compliment because my kids say I'm pretty boring and put a smiley face on it. Now. This does a few things. I saw you comment on that post I did about the differences in water and how blank water can eliminate blank, whatever you guys put in. So I'm gonna take that as a compliment because my kids say I'm pretty boring. Put a smiling face. Now, what does that do? Okay, first I see a doubt in their mind that maybe, a little bit of doubt, just the beginning, maybe the water they're drinking might not be so good without me saying that. I'm starting to seed it just a little, just a little bit. We'll get into how you seed it better than this, but this is just a little bit. You got to seed it like just so, you got to give, you ever heard that saying in the scriptures where you got to give them the milk before you give them the meat? Yeah. This is what we do in selling as well, okay? I do want to hop in. Now, what that does is it piques curiosity. So instead of information dumping, I'm triggering curiosity. I'm more neutral. Okay. Now, second, when I say, I'm going to take that as a compliment because my kids say I'm pretty boring and I put a smiley face, that does what? It helps disarm them because I'm almost like making fun of myself, not in a horrible way, but I'm just kind of making fun of myself. You know what they're going to do? Oh, watch nine out of 10. So like, Oh, I'm sure you're not boring. So even though now I had to put the smiley face behind it, because I don't put the smiley face in the DMS, they're like, Oh, you are pretty boring. It looks weird. <laughs> or if I'm on the phone, I'm like, oh, you know, just hanging out, being the boring guy. But if I'm like, just hanging out, being boring. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, he must be really boring. Okay, so see how my tone affects that? So if we can't use our tone in the DMs, then you just put, you have to use the emojis. It's kind of like your tone there. The emojis like signify the emotion that you're using. So on that, I put a smiley face behind it. Just do it next time and watch immediately the first thing they say, oh, I'm sure you're not boring. Now that helps them let their guard down. Now that, you, you can't just be like, oh, hey, let me tell you about it. The, oh, Jeremy didn't work. I, well, then I look at it, you're like, well, you just started talking about your thing right after, of course not, okay? So that's just one way. 
Okay, and we'll, we'll keep working on this, all right? This is just something I threw together real quick. What do you know about living water? <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. However, um, I'm gonna go out on the limb. Does the average prospect you're talking to really know what that even means? No. Mm, that could be a problem for you, okay? <laughs> Um, and it's just a very surface level question. So instead, like I said, we want to start building a gap from where they are to where they want to be. So instead, I'm going to do something like this. If I'm focused on the water, most of the time I wouldn't be. When we go through the workshop, I'm going to show you how to really focus on the two major problems, making more money, having more time, and then how them purchasing the product helps them start the business. A little bit of a different angle. I'm going to show you exactly what I did. Anybody have an organization that has over 300,000 people in it here? Oh. Does anybody want to learn how to do that? Yes. Does anybody want to know how I did that within like two years? Yes. Does anybody want to really understand how I did that as a first year network marketer with nobody not coming from another network marketing company with zero people? Yes. Okay. Sure about that. Okay. We're going to focus on that when we do the workshop, all right? So this stuff here. So when we ask, what do you know about living water? I'd rather relink you to this. Oh, give me that chair, thanks. So I can actually see it up here. Hey, um, I, don't, I don't have um, much time. Now, this is if you're in the chats, okay? I'll show you on the phone or Zoom, it's a little bit different. Hey, I don't have much time to chat, but do you, do you like drink water from like the tap, like the... <coughs> the unfiltered city water or some type of like basic filter or you just buy like the plastic bottled water from the store. <laughs> now, what did my tone, what did my tone communicate to you? Curiosity and kind of like concern. That seeds what in the prospect's brain? That maybe there's an issue with what I just asked. Because what if I said it like this? See the difference in the tonality. What if I said it like this? Hey, I don't have much time to chat, but do you like drink water from the tap, like the unfiltered city water, or some type of basic filtered uh, plastic bottled water from the store, or what do you do? Oh yeah, I just, I just go to the store. Oh, what if I do this? Hey, um, I, don't, I don't have much time to chat, but do you like um, drink water from the tap, like the you know, like the, the unfiltered city water or like some type of like basic filter or just buy like the, the plastic bottled water. <laughs> now, what did that seed in your mind? Oh, maybe those, aren't, maybe those aren't that good, but I didn't say they weren't that good. Because if I said they sucked, you might do what? Get defensive. Get defensive. See how I can see doubt by just using my tone and my facial expression. What is your facial expression? Your facial expression is the remote control to how your tone sounds. The first thing they teach you when you go to acting school is how to use your facial expressions to communicate and use your tonality. Because can, can I have a skeptical, challenging tone if my facial expression stays like this? That'd be really damn hard to do. I couldn't do that. What if you don't, it's, like it's hard to do it. What happens if you don't do anything about this? Facial expression communicates my tone. See what I'm doing there? So if I'm in the DMs, I have to use some type of like emoji. Now don't go like crazy emoji, like ooh, gross, because sometimes that'll be a little de defensive. What I would do is I'd actually send them a voice note. Yeah. Like if I was redoing, because back in my day, 2010, 2014, maybe they had that. I just, I had a basic Facebook account, right? I was doing like, you know, a, a pay-per-click ads on Google or just buying leads or just, you know, talking with people I knew, right? That's how I, I started my business and built it so big. But if I could redo it and I got them into reels, I'd send voice notes like this with my tone and it automatically seeds doubt. It seeds doubt without me telling them. If I tell them, it goes in one ear, out the other. I'm biased. I'm trying to sales, sell them, right? But by me seeding that, it causes them to have some doubt. Now, we can't just stop there and be like, oh, let me tell you about my thing. We have to, we're setting that up. See what we're doing there? Okay, let me show you a few others here. 
And like I said, when, after I finish the, the keynote, we're going to really get into like actual really what to say from A to Z. Okay. How about this one? Are you open to watching a super quick video that explains why this water is so powerful? <laughs> now, you haven't even helped them <laughs> build a gap from where they are to where they want to be. They don't even know they have a problem. So how can you ask them if they're open to looking at something that they don't even know they have a problem about? You're asking them if they're open to watching a super quick video. Nobody believes super quick video, even if it is. That's like when a telemarketer, when a salesperson calls you like, hey, do you have two, can I take two minutes of your time to tell you? And you're like, you don't believe them, do you? Because you know the salesperson is going to take longer than two minutes. So because you don't believe them, you automatically, they lower their, you lower their status in their mind, how you view them, and you try to get rid of them because you've just lost trust automatically. So when you say things like, are you watching? Now, you don't have to say, the video is going to be 67 minutes. You don't have to say that. I wouldn't say that either. I just don't need to say how long the video is going to be. I could say, are you opposed to looking at blah, 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 blah? Now, you're not going to do that yet because they don't even have a problem. So we can't ask them to be open about a problem they don't even know they have yet, right? And then when we say, the, because the water is so powerful, what the hell does that mean to the prospect? <laughs> The water's powerful, like mighty Thor. Like if you drink the water, you're gonna have like superhuman, like crazy, like spider web. Like what does that actually mean? I know it sounds cool to you, but how does it sound to your prospect who doesn't even know what's going on, right? See, it's okay, but I don't wanna train you how to be okay. I wanna train you how to have complete control of every conversation you're in. Remember, because the prospect have problems, your solution solves us. So you're going to get some people like this down here, but I'd rather help open up your market to this rather than this. Yes. See, I don't like those old sayings. When I got into network marketing, they said that to me. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's, why, that's, why, that's why a lot of you here in this, I'm not talking about you, but the company I'm with, I'm like, yeah, that's why you guys like struggle. You don't make that much money because that's what you think selling is. See, if I think that they want to make more money and have more time, which everybody does, and I focus on what I'm saying and asking, then I have a whole world. I have everybody's really my prospect at that point, okay? All right, let's keep moving on. Now, the third mode. Here's where it gets interesting. Can I have more hot water in here? Somebody in the, in the I don't know if there's somebody in the hotel that can be, like, put like, hot water up to here with a little bit of like, cold where it's not like killing me, but I'm almost out of water. That would be very nice. Thank you. Okay. Now, third mode of selling, the most persuasive, according to the data, the science, we're the most persuasive when we get others to persuade themselves, when we ask what are called neuro-emotional persuasion questions. If you've read the book, or maybe you're one of our clients in our virtual training programs, or maybe even if you follow me on Reels, sometimes we'll talk about neuro-emotional persuasion questions. Now, the question I always get asked, Jeremy, that sounds really good. How can I get someone to persuade themselves? That's the $1 trillion question. Because imagine if you knew how, if you had the skill. Because can you just walk up to your friend or you know, start talking with somebody on the phone from a room and be like, hey, hey, yeah, this thing is awesome, but just go ahead and persuade yourself. And by the way, I'm gonna send you the link to enroll and the machine's like 5,000 and you're Gucci, I'll see you on the onboarding call. We, so we can't do that, right? We have to learn specific skilled questions. We have to learn how and how to ask those that are gonna get them to emotionally open up, okay? We have to pull that structure where they get us to pull in. Now, I wanna make sure that you understand, when I'm talking about ADPQ questions, I'm not talking about questions that are designed to get your prospects to say what you want them to say. Some of you have been trained to do that, right? Yeah. If you get them to say yes 13 times, they have a 71% chance more likely to buy your, your thing. Anybody ever heard something like that? If you get them to say yes like 17 times in the presentation, um, does anybody have like the, the, the data that supports that? Oh, you just believe that because you read it in a book, didn't you? There's no data that actually says that. 
just so you're aware. In fact, a lot of times, I'm going to show you to do the exact opposite and get them to say no that will actually lead to the yes. Ah, Jeremy, oh, you ready for that? I told you. If we went down this path, it's going to be very hard to go back down the other path. So we're really going to screw with your mind. Just, okay. So I'm not talking about surface level questions either. The questions I'm referring to, like I said, are intended to bring out the prospect's emotions. To trigger what's called emotional drivers that get them into what's called their emotional state. Anybody heard of how do you get a, how do you get a human being into an emotional state? Tony Robbins talks about that, right? How do you get them from here into their emotional state? Now, this is a breakdown of NEPQ. These are the five stages. Remember that stands for neuro emotional persuasion question. Now, like I said, we train a lot of people in your industry that are in our uh, our client training virtual training programs. I've met a few of you that are actually in our NEPQ 3.0 and advanced inner circle, which is industry specific. And I can't tell you, we have, I don't even know, 18 some thousand testimonials from the last three years. And I can, I can, I mean, I've seen tons from your industry. People came in, they're making a thousand dollars a month, two grand a month, a year later, they're making 30, 50, two years later, they're making over seven figures a year. Now, I'm going on a limb. Did some of you know that I was in your industry? I think some of you knew I was in your industry. Okay. I got up to a little bit, a little bit under 2.4 million a year in your industry, and I did that within two years. <coughs> now, how is that possible to do that so quickly as a brand new person who's never been in MLM, who had zero people? Sometimes it's easy if they come over from another company, they're bringing 100,000 people or 50,000 people with them, depending on your comp plan, right? I'm gonna show you something. What's, what's that in the yellow there? That's your name. Oh, that's me, yes. I Googled this. I forgot about this. I'm like, oh, I think there was some article. So this was the end of my network marketing career, like my, close to my fifth year. It was, uh, that's the website there. You can go Google or whatever. It's the top 150 worldwide earners in MLM. You can see April 20, 2014, I'm that old. You have to submit like your, your W-2s, your 1099s, depending on your page. So you have to like prove that you actually made this money. That's me, number 45 in the world. And that, I think that was my third or fourth year, something like that. Now, had I continued, probably another 10 years, probably would have made a lot more than that. But that's besides the story. Now, do you see the person right here, number 44, where it says Nathan Ricks? He's a, he's a big time uh, network marketer. He passed away, actually, a couple years ago. I don't know if you know that. He had a, it was in a plane wreck. He was flying his own plane. Very sad. But the story behind that, how I got into network marketing, is Nathan Ricks, he was a distributor for a company called New Skin out of Utah, if you guys, big company. And somebody in his downline, when I had my sales job there in Utah, tried to recruit me. He brought, like the guy in his downline brought me to like a meeting like this. And Nathan was up there presenting and he like, want, the guy wanted to have me meet Nathan. And I remember when I met Nathan after for like, uh, like just like a lunch or snacks or whatever, he totally blew me off. And he later told the guys like, I don't think that guy would be very good for network marketing. <laughs> and that, when I heard that, cause I wasn't gonna do it, that caused me to be like, that mother effer, I'm gonna freaking show him. <laughs> and so, now Nathan, I'm sure it's not a big deal, right? It's, it is what it is. But that drove me, that put like a chip on my shoulder. Had he recruited me in his downline, He'd been further up that list, right? Really, really quick. Okay, there you go. Never judge a book by its cover sometimes, right? There you go. All right, now, would it help you if I started showing you some maybe NEPQ specific questions for your industry? Okay. Okay, now I'm only gonna show you a few during this next 30, 40 minutes, and then after the break, we're gonna come back in. I'm gonna show you the entire sales structure and we're gonna role play, and you're gonna come up here up to the on stage, and we're gonna learn, we're gonna to start to learn how to do this. Now, are you gonna be able to learn and master everything today, in one day? Okay. As my good friend Bradley always says, is training something you did, or is training something you do? Well, training something you do if you wanna make a lot of money. Does Steph Curry train something he did, or something he does every day? Michael Jordan, something he did. Some, Serena Williams, something she did. Something she does. Okay, Julia Roberts, something she did, 
something that she does. See, that's why they make all the money. See a parallel with any, any successful person you admire in life. They don't view training as something they did. They view it as something they do daily. And that's why they're ahead of you so far. Now, how do you change that? Well, you just do the same thing. Train something you do, okay? All right, now let's move on. Before I do that, I want to show you how, what's going on in your prospect's brain when you, when you talk to them. So within the first seven to 12 seconds of any sales conversation that you're ever going to be in, so that is, it could be on the phone, it could be in person, could be on Zoom, whatever you use, your prospects, they cannot even help it subconsciously. It's the way our brain is wired by God are picking up on your verbal and nonverbal cues based off what you are saying and asking and how your tone is coming across. That quickly. So when you have a telemarketer call you and they start talking really fast and excited, what's going on in your brain? Salesperson trying to sell something, not interested, and you hang up and you ever wonder like, oh, I don't even know what they were saying. You didn't even hear the words they said. Isn't that remarkable? Wow. Do you know why? I'll give you a little lesson. I'm going to take a little bit more time. There's three parts of your brain. I'm, I'm going to give you the easy version. Okay? There's, I'm not going to, there's different, different behavioral scientists will call it different names. But there's like the first part is your survival part of your brain. Uh -huh. It's called like your reptilian part of the brain. That is where you start to pick up on sounds, tone. Okay? So whenever God put the first people here on the earth, whenever that was, okay, we had that survival part of our brain. So when the tiger came around us, we're like, oh, I, you know, I need to protect myself. Now, in our society, we're still trying to protect ourselves from the tigers, you know, the bad, the bad guys trying to shoot us or whatever it is. But we're also trying to protect ourselves from what? Being sold, right? Because you're constantly being sold to every day. Now, some of you are like, no, I don't talk to salespeople every day. Yeah, you do. What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning besides go to the bathroom? You grab your phone and you start looking at what? Social media. And you start seeing ads trying to sell you something. Then you walk into your kitchen, start drinking your coffee, turn on the TV. You see commercials trying to sell you something. You get into the car to go to work or to wherever you're going. You turn on the radio and you hear ads trying to sell you something. You drive down the road and there's like these big signs on the side of the billboards and they're trying to sell you something. You go to your job if you're still working full time at a job and during lunch you get on the phone and you start seeing your aunt and she's pitching her latest, greatest, whatever thing. The 17 things she's gotten into in the last three years, right? That's the best thing, right? See, you're constantly being sold to all of the time. And because of that, human beings, you, me, all of us, have built up walls of defense. So whenever we feel or hear sounds or words that we identify coming from someone trying to sell us, we immediately emotionally shut down. And we either try to get rid of them, fight mode, or flight mode, we're like, oh yeah, that sounds really good. And we listen to the whole conversation. And then at the end, your prospect says, it sounds really good. I just need to talk with my wife. I need to talk with my CPA. I need to talk with my mom. I need to talk with my grandpa. I need to talk with my best friend who lives in a van down by the river. And so, and so, and so. And then you never hear from them again. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Now. So when you come across aggressive in your conversation, now when I say aggressive, I don't mean like you're mean. I mean like you're too excited. Now that doesn't mean be boring. I don't mean like go from here to here. There's like a middle ground. Okay, so I don't mean be boring. Sometimes people are like, Jeremy, I'm trying out. I didn't, we review calls and they sound really boring. What is going on? I don't mean be boring like, a, oh, I hope you try. But you, the more excited you sound, what is the average prospect going to associate excitement from? Salesperson trying to sell me something because that's how salespeople are taught to ask, right? So when you come across needy, 
When you come across, when you have anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. You ever felt needy on a call with a prospect? Oh, yeah. Now, if you feel that, what do you feel the prospect is feeling from you? So, they're subconsciously, they're listening to your tone. And when it sounds needy or anxiety or nervous, it triggers them to feel that you are hiding something or something is bad or not true that you're saying. See what I mean? Okay. When we come across attached, now what do I mean by attached? Oh, I'm so excited. I know you're going to love it. Can you call me back after you watch it today? I think it's going to be so great. Is that attached? It sounds attached. It sounds like you need them to join. And when somebody, it's like when you're dating originally and somebody starts texting you and they sound really needy in the text and when you don't respond and they respond and they send you four, five, six texts because you never respond, how do you view them? Lower status. Even if you might have liked them and thought they were good looking, you start to view them at a lowered status because they feel needy to you. Wow. See what we're going? Okay, there you go. Hopefully I'm helping your dating lives too. Okay. Now, <laughs> So that triggers them, like I said, to go into fight or flight mode. These are triggered reactions. Because did your prospect, do you think they woke up that morning that they were going to talk to you, that you had a scheduled appointment with them, let's say, did they wake up and they're like, you know what? When she asked me that third question, because she sounds really needy and she sounds really enthusiastic. I think I'm gonna go into fight or flight mode and say, hey, enough with the questions. Can you just tell me how much it's gonna cost and I'll tell you if I'm interested? Did she plan that out? Or is that a triggered reaction based on how you're communicating to them? Yes. Ah, so if it's coming from us, that means what? That we can change that. And we have the power to change that. It doesn't come from them at all. See how we're, where we're going? Now, once you learn what we're going to train you, this, and this is just the start today, once you learn how to become, how you come across more neutral, more unbiased, like I'm not, not quite sure we could even help you. I'd have to know more about X, Y, Z. You're more neutral. You're more unbiased. You're more collective. You're more calm. You're assertive. Assertive does not mean overly enthusiastic. Assertive is more like an expert. More like an expert talks. More like an authority, a trusted authority. And especially when you come across detached. How many really successful experts are attached? They don't need to be attached. They're detached. They know that you have the problems and they have the solution to solve those, but it, has, it doesn't affect them if you don't do anything about it. It only affects who? Oh, you. See the difference there? Once we learn the right questions asked, once we learn tone, it triggers their brain to become curious enough where they want to engage and actually open up to you because they feel like you might have something important for them. They don't even know what it is yet. And I'll give you an example of this. Let's say that you're walking into the grocery store, okay? I'm just gonna take a little bit more time if this is okay. I'm gonna go over the keynote time. I know I have 20 minutes, I'm gonna go like 35. So, well, we're going to come back. It's all the same. If I, if I only had 30 minutes, I'd hurry up. But I'm going to give you a few examples. So let's say you're walking into a grocery store, and all of a sudden you hear like a lady yelling, like screaming. Your first reaction, remember I'm going back to the brain, is your survival part of your brain is like this. You react to the sound, to the tone. You react. Am I safe? What's going on? Is there you know, a shooting? Like what's happening? So you react. You didn't even hear her words yet. Okay. That's in your survival part of your brain. Now instantly, in about a second or so, I'm gonna keep this term very simple for you, it goes into what we would call their midbrain. The midbrain starts to interpret the words from that lady. And then immediately it goes to your problem-solving part of your brain, which is your neocortex. And your problem-solving brain says like, oh, it's just a lady yelling at her son to, to be careful crossing the street, I'm okay. But you instantly reacted from the tone first going through your survival brain before you interpreted her words to mean that you're okay. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, I just want to make sure you understand this. Because so once you understand this, when you're on conversations, you hold a complete advantage because you know what's going on in their mind, okay? Closest thing you can become to becoming a mind reader. All right, now I'm going to ask you this. How do you get your prospect to view you at a higher status? Because, like I said earlier, how are salespeople and, dare I say, distributors in network marketing viewed in society as a whole? 
if I'm really honest, how are they viewed? Lower status. Even if you are a millionaire or multimillionaire in this industry, the average person still views you at a what? A lowered status based on what? Because of the way typically people in this industry and salespeople in general communicate with other people. That is caused by us, not them. Okay? Now, I'm going to ask you again. If I show you some questions you are asking right now, which you feel are building rapport, but are really not, are you going to be upset at me on Monday? Because when you get on calls, you're going to be like, oh, I shouldn't say that. Okay, so are we, are we okay to move forward? or Because I can, we can stop everything now. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. Now, in behavioral science, this is called social dynamics. How does society view you? How does a person view you at a much higher status than themselves in the conversation you're talking about? So even if you're talking to someone that makes 25 billion times more money than you, and you're talking about your opportunity, how can you, even though they make way more money than you, how can you get them to view you at a much higher status with what you're talking about? That's called situational status. It's called rank framing or status framing. Back in medieval times or thousands of years ago, how did they rank a human being? Usually it was the tattoos and symbols on your arms. That's how they ranked you, right? Or if you're a queen or queen, like that's how you're ranked. How does society rank us now? Usually by how much money you make, the things you drive, the cars you have, well, just that's how they rank, that's how they view you, okay? So if you don't have those things yet, notice I said yet, how do you get situational status where they view you as an expert, far more as an expert in what you're talking about? That's what I'm gonna show you, okay? Now, I don't know if I should show you this. I'm a little bit worried. So when you get on, do some of you like get on Zoom with prospects or call them on the phone after, because I know a lot of you like get them in the DMs, right? Or, or you talk with somebody that you might know, you get them on Zoom, you get them on the phone, and typically, you ask this type of predictable question. Hey, how are you doing today? Hey, how's your day going, George? Yeah, how's the weather over there in Dallas? Oh, yeah, the weather's so cool here, it's so awesome. Um, yeah, did you watch the game last night? Oh, it's such a cool game, yeah, so awesome. Um, see, when you ask these type of predictable questions, that every salesperson that's ever tried to sell them anything from a vacuum cleaner to a car to life insurance policy to a home to maybe cybersecurity for their office and they are all asking the same type of question what would the average prospect immediately associate you with like everybody else and a society and if they view salespeople at a lowered status how do they view you if you're asking the same questions that all other salespeople ask them more than likely at a much lower status unless they're lay down lay downs they'll, they'll open up to you okay because with most prospects this is how they interpret that type of question how's your day going how you doing those type of ridiculous questions. here's how they view it i'm just trying to get you to like me so i can sell you my product my service thing because when salespeople ask you that question, what usually goes on in your mind? Could I be right? They're just trying to get me to like them so they can sell me something. And immediately what? The, what goes up? The guard goes up. And do you ever notice that when you do that, the guard goes up and you ask good questions, but they give you vague, generalized, surface level answers? Well, now you know why. Because you're triggering that from the very first words out of your mouth. Okay, now don't worry. I'm here to show you how to change that. I'm not just gonna show you what to do that's bad, I'm gonna show you what to do instead, okay? All right, now this is an example of what we call NEPQ connection questions. Now connection questions 
basically, they, they get the prospect, they take the focus off you immediately and they automatically put it on the prospect. And what they also do is we want to get the prospect into what we call results-based thinking over price or cost-based thinking. Do some of you ever get like, oh, this seems really expensive, or you guys, is that just way too much money for me, or I don't have the money. Do you know why? It's because you're getting them, you're keeping them in price or cost-based thinking, where I'm gonna show you how to get them into results-based thinking, where they don't even look at the price. They look at the end result. And I'm gonna show you that, okay? All right, now, let me give you an inbound example here. And like I said, I'm gonna go over a little bit over time, because we got all day, if you guys are okay with that, all right? Let's, what is, what is this, the shaking thing over there? <laughs> Who is that over there? Oh, what is that? <clears throat> I'm not used to that at keynotes. I'm like, man, this, this group is really lively. They're shaking things over there. <laughs> okay, so let's say, let's, say, let's say that you have an inbound lead. Somebody's commented on one of your reels, okay, and you DM them, you built up somewhat of a gap, and they agreed to book on your calendar. Do some of you do this? Like use Reels, get them on your calendar, yep. book a phone call, yep. book a Zoom call. Anybody do that in here? Some of you? Okay. Now, obviously, if it's a friend, we would have to, you know, if we already know them, we would, we would definitely tweak this. But let's say it's a stranger that's been following you on Instagram. I'm just making something up. And they get on the phone with you. Um, like I said, if, it's an, if we're talking to a friend at a networking event or whatever, we would obviously tweak this. But let's say I'm on Zoom, I'm seeing you. Hey, can you hear me? He's like, I can hear you. Can you see me? Yeah, I can see you, stuff like that. And then immediately, I'm going to go right into results-based thinking like this. Okay, so it looks like we were, I know we were chatting on uh, Instagram the other day about you looking at maybe, you know, starting your own business so you could make more money, right? Okay, it looks like we were chatting the other day, I think it was a couple days ago, about you looking at maybe starting your own business so you can make more money, right? Right. What did I instantly do right there? That's such a basic question, but what does it do? What is the end result of what you sell? Starting a business so you can what? Make more money. Do you see how I'm automatically getting that person into what? Results-based thinking by saying starting your own business so you can make more money, right? They're gonna be like, right automatically results-based thinking. That's just the very beginning. See how base, see how easy that is, okay? Take a picture of that. Like I said, we've got, I have all the sales structure written out for you already. I shouldn't have told you that, but we're gonna train on that. <laughs> and maybe, maybe Colton and those guys will give it to you one day. Okay, now let me show you a few things that I did here. Why would I use the word possibly start your own business? Yes, I wanna be more neutral. Okay, because if I assumed, look how it sounds. Okay, so it looks like we were chatting on IG the other day about you starting your own business so you can make more money. Some A-types would be like, well, I'm just looking at it. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm gonna do it yet. And you immediately just did what? Triggered, <laughs> resistance. All I had to do was put the term possibly, the word possibly before it. Nobody's ever gonna say, no, I'm not possibly looking at making more money to start their own business. Like they can't say that. See, I neutralize that. See how that one neutral word, possibly, now you don't wanna keep saying possibly 17 times during the conversation, because then it's gonna sound weird, okay? But that term neutralizes it where you'll never trigger sales resistance, just by putting a neutral term there. See how I want to use words that what? Work with human behavior rather than work against it. See how one word can completely change the dynamic of that opening conversation, because if you trigger sales resistance right there, status goes what? Down. Lower, and now the rest of the conversation, you have to like, oh, try to get back up to at least the same status as them. See, I want to make sure that when I come into a conversation, even in that first 30 seconds, they view me at least at the same status as they are, and during that conversation, I start to raise my status in their mind, and by the end, they view me as the authority, the expert who's going to get them where they want to be. See what I just did there? Okay, let's keep going on here. All right, now this is an example. I'm just giving you a few random examples and then we're gonna give you everything when we actually do the training. This is called an NEPQ status frame. Okay, so I want, has anybody ever had training where they talk to you about getting on a call and they want you to do like what's called like an upfront contract? Where, has anybody ever heard of the upfront contract? 
So, and it's not bad, but sometimes it can trigger sales resistance. So has anybody ever gotten on a call like, okay, towards the end of the call, you know, I'm gonna, here's how the call is gonna go. So you tell them, here's how the call is gonna go today. I'm gonna ask you some questions, and depending on your answers, at the end of the conversation, you, you know, you can decide if we're a good fit for you, and we can decide if you're a good fit for us. Sound fair? You ever heard of that? Yes. Oh. Do we really believe that the average prospect thinks at the end of the conversation, if they're like, here's my credit card, I am ready to sign up and buy and change my life. Nope, nope, I don't think you're a good fit for us. I can't take your money. I'm so sorry, you're not a good fit for us. Do you really believe your prospects would believe that? So when you say things like that, that they don't believe, what does that do? Lower status, you lose trust, sales pretty much over. Or if a lot of people are like, yeah, that sounds fair. And then what are they doing in the background? Stay surface level now because they think they're going to get closed at the end, right? So when you ask questions, they never what? Emotionally open up. They stay surface level. They stay logical. And then what objections do you get at the end? doesn't sound very fun. Why are you guys killing yourself? That's no bueno. All right, so we want to do something different, okay? Let's see if I can get the right tone here. Got to warm up. Okay, yeah, now, there's, after that first connection question I showed you, there is one between that. So you wouldn't hop right into this, and I will show you on the sales structure that we wrote for you, uh, that we do with other companies. The difference here but this is kind of like the third connection question you're going to use yeah and i would say you know really this call is it's pretty basic it's really more for us to find out you know kind of what you do for a living now and i would say maybe what they're what they're paying you compared to maybe what you're really wanting to make to see kind of what that gap looks like and then you know towards the end of the call if you feel like hey you know this might be what you're looking for we can talk about uh, possible next steps would that help you now, let's analyze that first paragraph. Why would I say, eh, this call is pretty basic. Why would I downplay it? What does that do? Yeah, because I, I want them to do what? Because a lot of you are like, oh, this, I'm so excited for you to be on this call. But I'm downplaying it. Because if I downplay it, that's, a, that's in, in, in brain science, that's a term called mismatching. Has anybody heard of that? When you mismatch and you downplay things, typically people upplay them. But when you upplay things, people downplay, especially if they view you as a salesperson, right? Because you're like, oh, you're gonna save so much money. Well, it's not gonna be that much. I mean, you're not gonna save that much money. It's only gonna be like 23%. That's a lot of money for us. <laughs> See? I downplay, they upplay. I upplay, they downplay. You wanna be careful with that, okay? So I'm, I'm downplaying. Yeah, this first call, it's, it's pretty basic. It's really more for us to find out you know, kind of what you do for a living now, you know, kind of what they're paying you, those type of things, and how that is working out compared to maybe where you're wanting to be. What I just do there? Look at what I said there. What they're doing now with you, what they're paying you, if I'm focused on the business, right? Remember, making more money, having more time, problems you solve, compared to maybe where you're wanting to be. What did I just do visually? I just started to visually put a gap in their mind. See how I seeded a gap? Oh, you didn't see that, did you? Because what if I did this? And the first part of this call, it's pretty basic. It's really more for us to find out kind of what you do for a living and, and what they're paying you and kind of what you're wanting to make to, you know, to see what the gap looks like. Well, that didn't do anything. So I need to, like this. Don't be like this. See people on the side, like, do this. Yeah, the first part of this call, it's pretty basic. I want them to lower their guard. I want them to relax because if they relax, they are more willing to emotionally open up. Okay? There's no guard. The, sale, the guard is gone. Like, I want to keep it. Do you guys like competing against the wall of resistance? Like, I don't like that. I'd rather not have any wall of resistance. Okay? Much easier to sell. Way less objections. Okay? Way faster way to build your business. Okay? Uh, compared to maybe where you're wanting to be to see what that gap looks like. And then towards the end of the call, if you feel like, hey, you know, this might be what you're looking for, we can talk about possible next steps. Would that help you? No one will ever say, no, it would not help me to talk about possible next steps. They can't do that. You see what I just did there? Why did I use the words might be what you're looking for? We can talk about possible next steps. 
See what I'm, now, at the end of that conversation, I can be more assumptive. But in the beginning, when I have really zero trust and credibility, the more assumptive I am, the more the guard goes up. So I want to use might be impossible. I wouldn't use that at the very end, and I will show you that later today. Okay, I'm going way too slow. I've got to keep looking up. Okay, solution awareness questions. Here's an example. Gets them to see what their future looks like once the newfound problems are solved. You guys might want to put more time back on the clock. All right. <laughs> now, here's an example of this, okay? So tell me, so this is probably three-fourths of the conversation. So tell me about the money. I mean, you had mentioned that you wanted to make more money because, I mean, as you know, like working for someone else, you know, sometimes you're, you know, you're fairly limited on, on what they're going to want to pay you. So without that limit there, like what would you really want to make like in your own business? Like what would be, I don't know, like what would be like your, let's say like your ideal income, maybe even annual, like what, what do you really want to make? Now, why did I really slow that question down? Because I knew exactly what I was going to say there. Yeah. But did I act like I knew what I was going to say there? No. You viewed me as thinking deeper about what I was going to ask you. And psychologically, what does that do to the prospect? Picture. Causes them to think deeper about my question. Because now I gave them time because I paced it out verbal paste it out, it gives them more time to think deeper about it. Because if I did it like this, oh, so tell me about the money. You had mentioned you wanted to make more money because as you know, working for someone else, sometimes you're fairly limited on what they're going to want to pay you. So without that limit there, what would you really want to make in your own business? Oh, I don't know, just some more money. Need your question, ask too fast, no time for them to internalize what I'm asking, surface level response. But because I paced it out, they did what? Hang on to every word and question I'm asking. I'm causing their brain to do that. Did you see what I did when I walked out on stage here? When I sat in silence for 30 seconds? What did that do in your mind? It caused you to pay attention. That's a pattern interrupt. I did that on purpose to show you. It caused all of you to put your phones down or to like sit here like, What's going on? I don't, it's like a mystery. I don't know what's happening. And it caused you to hone into me. Now I'd come on here and jumped and shouted and, and hey, that's cool. And like, hey, I'm so excited to be here. You might've kind of tuned out because you're used to that. But I interrupted your pattern. See, I, a magician never tells the secrets. I just told you that. See what I did? That's exactly why I did that. Pattern right, okay? All right, let's keep moving on. Now, let's say if they're like, oh, you know, if I could make 6,000 a month, I'd be happy. Now, what is your average price of your product? Like five grand for you guys? Yeah. Is somebody gonna spend, invest five grand to make six grand a month? Maybe, but that's not much of a gap. Because if they're already making four or five, and they say I wanna make six, see how that gap's much smaller? So how do I get them to have a bigger gap in their mind of what they really wanna make if I'm focused on bringing them into my business? I mean, is that your ideal income or would you rather make more? Oh, no, I'd really want to make more, but what do you really want to make? See what I just did? Oh, if I could make $150,000 a year, that'd be great. See how I just did what? Built a bigger gap. The bigger the gap, the more likely they are to take more funds to invest with you. The smaller the gap, the more money objections you are guaranteed to get. You see the difference there? All right, I'm gonna show you more of this when we get through the training, all right. And then I might say, okay, so the reason why, okay, I just showed you that, there you go, right there. Okay, well, the reason why I asked you that is I, I really only work, you know, look for someone who wants to make, I don't know, I mean, at least a $100,000 a year. I mean, are you, are you open to making that type of money in your life? Oh, yeah, for sure, but what do you really wanna make? Oh, man, if I could make 200, that'd be great. So with what you're doing right now, like between you and Mary's income combined, how close are you to making 200,000 every single year? Oh yeah, we're about halfway there. So if you stay in that job, just be completely real with me, how many years would it take you before you yourself were making 200,000 every single year just yourself? There's no way I could do that. What did I just do? Build a huge gap and he, just, he or she just said, if I stay with what I do, there's no way I can get to what I said I just wanted. Who's persuading who? 
they're persuading themselves. See how I'm doing that. Now I'm going to show you a lot more. Don't worry. I'm just giving you a little warm up here. All right? Give me a little warm up. All right, consequence questions. Oh, maybe. Yes. Right there? Now, this is all going to be on your sales structure, just so you know. Way more than this. I just gave you a little hint here. Just getting you a little bit excited internally before we get into the real training. Because you're going to need to know everything to say before this and after. And you're going to need to know how to react if it doesn't go your way, because it doesn't necessarily go this way 100% of the time. Unless you want to sound like a scripted robot, which I definitely would not encourage that, because they will emotionally shut down if, they sound like, if you sound like a robot. Okay? <clears throat> Got it? Be a lot more. Okay, consequence questions. Helps the prospect see what the consequences are if they don't do anything about solving their problem. Okay? Now, let's take a look at this. How many of this, how many of you ever get a call or an email from a prospect that you thought was really, really interested and they say this, hey, we really liked you. You get an email. Hey, we really liked you and what you had to say in, in that webinar thing you had to go to us, the opportunity, but we decided just not a good time for us to start this now. Keep in touch. How many of you get something like that? We really like the presentation, the water. It makes so much sense, but it's just, not, it's just not a good time for us right now. But keep in touch. And what do you do? Call them back, try to argue. Like, no, you need to start this now because you can make more money. And you, How many of those do you win? Mm, little. Okay, you want me to show you what to do? Okay. Well, first of all, when I train you later today, I'm going to show you how to build such a big gap that this hardly ever happens. Because instead of just giving you band-aids, I'd rather just solve the problem from even happening in their mind. Okay? I'll give you a band-aid right now. Okay, so I'm going to say something like this. I might call them, hey, John, yeah, that's not a problem. I, I, got, your, I got your message. I completely understand. Um, can, I, can I ask you something? What did I just do there? Can I, can I ask you something? Notice how I pace it out, rather than saying, let me ask you a question, and then ask a question. Oh, wow. See how I'd steamroll in there? They're like, ugh, can I, can I ask you something? What is my tone? Just communicate with that. Curiosity. Concern. Now, because my tone communicates that I'm concerned, he or she is always going to be like, yeah, what's going on? I automatically, with my concern tone seated, there might be something going on here they don't know. See how my tone communicates it. Can I, can I ask you something? Yeah, go ahead. Then I'm going to say this. Now they're open. I'm going to say, how can I communicate to you that you might be making a mistake without you getting upset with me? Sure, Jeremy, what did you have in mind? Hear my tone again. How can I communicate to you that you might be making a mistake without you getting upset with me. Now, what type of tone did I just use? Concern. The prospect interprets my intention of that question as what? I'm concerned for their situation, which emotionally does what? Opens them up to re-engage. Opens them up to become more open. And now, if they're open, is it easier for me to help them overcome and find out what the real concern is? Rather than throwing out a rebuttal, hoping and praying it's going to work? You see, see how I set that up? Okay, we'll go through a lot more of that in the training. All right, now, if you guys want more questions like this, I'm going to give you this QR code. You can join one of our free Facebook groups. That's called Sales Row. I'm going to leave this open for nine seconds, so you better get on that real quick. That's a QR code. Join, you're welcome to join one of our free Facebook groups. Some of you are probably in it, it sounds like, salesrevolution.pro. And tell them you saw me at this speaking engagement. And we will give you, if you don't have this, it's called the NEPQ Black Book of Questions. We will give that to you for free. We only charge like 30 bucks for it, but we'll give that to you for free. But just tell them you saw me at this event. That is the QR code to join the free Facebook group. I'm going to give you seven seconds. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right. Now, let's keep going. Step number three is probably the most important that I can show you. And that's eliminating sales resistance, okay? So how do you go from where you are to becoming the trusted authority in your prospect's mind? 
Because in every conversation you're having, it's all about neutralizing the hidden pressure, the sales pressure that's in the conversations, in the DMs, in person, on the phone, on Zoom, doesn't matter. It's about neutralizing that hidden pressure. I already showed you a few things to do that. Now, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the ABCs of closing. Ever, anybody ever watched this movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? It's like from the 1980s or 90s, it's like a really old movie. Raise your hand if you've ever seen this. <laughs> if anybody comes from a sales background, it's like this is something you're forced to watch. It's like, they're like, watch this show, you know? Now, let me do this. How can I communicate to you that the mantra of always be closing, pressure, 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 is actually causing you to lose sales and recruits that you should be making. That our clients who are in your industry make every single day. Now how can I communicate that to you without you getting angry with me? <laughs> see what I just did? Okay. You see, that mantra is what average sales people do in our day and age. Now that doesn't mean you get to the end and you're like, well, um, if you're interested, uh, I guess just email me back. Do you think I made multiple seven figures a year in this industry and three others by not closing? Okay, there has to be a middle ground. Okay, more like an expert. You see, selling, if you wanna be a top 1% earner in this industry, selling is not adversarial. It is not you against the prospect trying to win them over and manipulate them so you can make money. You will play the numbers game if you do that, I can assure you, okay? Selling is collaborative. It's you working with the prospect to help them find and solve problems to get where they want to go. Now, here's what we're gonna focus instead on later today. We're gonna to learn the ABDs of selling. That stands for always be disarming. From the very first words out of your mouth to the questions you ask and how you use your tone, we're continually getting our prospects to let their guard down and keep their guard down. Because when you learn how to detach yourself from the sale, now that doesn't mean you're not trying to get the sale, but you wanna keep that internally, you wanna keep it to yourself, right? Because the moment you go external with you trying to close the deal, the prospect does what? They feel it, they feel the attachment, their guard goes up and now you're competing against the wall of resistance. So if we want them to keep their guard down, we have to detach ourselves. And when you do that, what happens psychologically is you remove the sales pressure from that conversation where the prospect feels it is a natural conversation. Now, it is not a natural winging it conversation, talking about the weather and who won the game and BS. It is a very skilled conversation. And the prospect doesn't know what's going on, but they emotionally open up because of your skill level. Now, remember when I asked some of you, like I pretended to be like a network marketer and I'm like, hey, you know, why should I switch to your company? I've got a good comp plan. Remember the three people that I had come up here to do that? Yeah. Do you want me to show you what I would do yeah. if somebody said that? Yeah. Okay, because I had a lot of people that would do that when I was in network marketing. I'm like, I need to develop something to get them to let their guard down. So I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, what do most distributors do? Does this sound familiar? Why should I go with you? Oh, well, I mean, you should go with us because we're the number one company in the industry. We have the best products. Our founders have the most integrity. We've been around for a long time. We've got the best comp plan. Our company is a triple A rated the BBB. Our products are the safest. We have the best this, we have the best this. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> so instead of telling them and trying to sell them on why you're the best, why not try finding out why they even asked you the question in the first place? What is behind the question? See where we're going with this? So when the prospect says this, let's get them to let their guard down, okay? Now, do we know we can help them? Yes. Do they know we can help them within the first 30 seconds of a conversation we have zero trust and zero credibility? No. So what is my first job? To admit that I might not be able to help them, which some of you are like, no, Jeremy, oh my God, you're gonna lose a sale if you admit that. Now, 
I know by the end of that conversation, I'm going to start building such a big gap because I've got them to let their guard down that by the end, they're going to tell me why the comp plan, why the company, why my opportunity is way better for them than what they said 20 minutes ago sucked. Okay? Okay, so let me show you. Now, here's what I'm going to have you do. All right, who, who did I use? Who was the... Can I, I have one of the three that I brought up on stage come back up here real quick. One of the three that I brought up on stage, who was it? <laughs> one of the three. Okay, so why don't, we, why don't we just do it out here? I'm gonna give you a microphone real quick. Okay, so why don't, you, why don't you give me that thing I'm talking to and you're like, hey, you know, why should we, you know, I've got a good comp plan, like why should I go with you? Something like that. Now for you guys, I want you to pay attention to my tone. I want you to pay attention to my body language. And I w when you feel the pressure go out of the room, when I do this, I want you to raise your hand. As soon as you feel the pressure start leaving the conversation, raise your hand. Hold that, I can memorize this. What's your name? Mason. Mason? Okay. Give it to me, baby. So, why should I buy your product? What, what yeah. makes you better than the competition? Well, maybe, I mean, maybe nothing. You know, and I'm not quite sure that you should even do anything yet. You know, we'd, we'd have to understand, like with your comp plan, I'd have to understand a little bit more about kind of how it's laid out as far as what they're paying you and maybe kind of the results you're getting that, especially from your downline, to kind of see what that gap looks like. Um, I would say just to see if we even help, because I mean, you might even be better off just staying with who you already have. Are you with me on that? Yeah. Something like that. Now let's do that again. I'm gonna do a different angle. Okay, say, say uh, instead of saying about the product, say, um, well, why should we go with your company? I'm pretty happy with wh who I have. Why should we go with your company? I'm pretty happy with yeah. where I'm at. Well, I'm, I'm, just so you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure you should yet. You know, we, we'd have to understand more about kind of what you're doing with the company as far as the comp plan and kind of what they're, kind of what they're paying you compared to maybe where you're wanting that to be. Um, because you might be better off staying with who you already have. Are you maybe a, opposed to having a brief conversation around it? No. Okay. All right. Now, what did I do there? Tone's a little bit off. Why would I say, well, I'm not quite sure that you should yet. Why would I say that? What does that do? Design. Now, notice how I paused about two seconds. Why would I pause? Why not say, well, I'm not quite sure that you should yet. I'd have to understand more about the comp plan you have with them. Yeah, it's like a script. He doesn't have any time to internalize that. But when I say, well, I'm not quite sure that you should yet. Now, don't wait 12 seconds, because then he'll be like, well, what about this? What about that? I want to wait about two. Well, I'm not quite sure that you should yet. You know what they're going to do? They'll just deflate. It's like a football. Like, like, you just like a noodle. They'll just deflate. I'm not quite sure that you should yet. You know, I'd have to understand, you know, more about the comp plan you have with them and maybe the results you're getting from it and look at the products. I mean, you're a fairly decent company because you might be better off just staying with them. Are you with me on that? Now, why would I say because you might be better off just staying with them? What does that do? Because some of you are like, no, Jeremy, don't say that. You're just, you're reinforcing that he should. Go ahead. Well, I'm going to help them make that decision, yeah. But I have to get them to let their guard down. If I cannot get them to let their guard down, there's probably no sale that's going to happen. I know that I can help them, but he doesn't know that. I have zero trust and credibility with him right now. He doesn't know me, right? I just started talking to him 30 seconds ago. How can I, how can I have any trust with this person, okay? So I wanna get him to let his guard down, and as I'm in that conversation asking more questions and seeding doubt, I'm doing what? Building a gap from where he is to now where he sees he can be, and now he becomes really open to what I'm talking about. Now, why not say, are you open to talking about that? Why would I say, are you opposed? Because remember, you're supposed to get him to People say yes to say 17 no. times. Everybody wants to say no, so I'm just using it to his benefit and mine. Are you opposed to having a conversation? Yes, I'm opposed. Hard for them to say, yes, I'm opposed, then say, no, I'm not really open. See how I'm changing a word? Are you opposed to having a conversation? No, I'm not opposed. What do you have in mind? It's hard for them to say, yes, I'm opposed. They're all going to say, no, I'm not opposed. What do you have in mind? See, I'm mismatching. Okay, thank you very much. Well done there. Can I have the microphone? Okay.
All right, a couple last things, then we're gonna wrap up before the training. All right, anybody, raise your hand if you ever get an A-type personality, hard to open up, surface level, cards to their chest, poker face, no emotion, you know they have problems, but they're just staying surface level. And then what objections do you get at the end? Can you think about it? Research, more information, talk to my spouse, talk to my CPA, I need to talk with my mom to see if it's a good investment. <laughs> I need to talk with my uncle in Georgia about what? Okay, okay. Now, here's a technique to use. So, Let's say I'm three-fourths in the conversation. I can't get them to open up. This is like my last thing I can do. Um, Mary, can I, can I ask you something? Sure, go ahead. Between you, know, you and I and, let's say, off the record, what's the real reason why you might be looking to start your own business? Well, and then they tell you. Between you and I and you know, off the record, why would I say off the record? Remember when a journalist is interviewing somebody and they're like, hey, this is gonna be off the record. What's really going on? Oh, trust. So I'm saying off the record. Between you and I, you know, off the record, what's the main reason why you might be looking to start your own business? Well, the reason, see what I'm doing there? Okay, you want me to give you another one? I'll give you these all day. All right. Let's say you don't know how to help them overcome the I wanna think it over objection, which is actually not an objection. We'll talk about that later. But let's say you don't know what to do yet, okay? You can do the same thing. This is like your last resort. Um, now, you always wanna say, you wanna say, can, hey, can I, can I ask you something? Like concern time. Can I, can I ask you something? Sure, go ahead. What's really holding you back from moving forward so you guys can make more money? Now, what tone did that signify? Let me do that again. It's hard to do it up on stage. Can I ask you something? Sure, go ahead. Um, between you and I, and you know, off the record, what's really holding you back from moving forward so you can make more money? And what do I do with my hand? What do I put on my chest? What does that signify? What does that communicate in my body language? Compassion. That I'm concerned, that I care for her. Now she sees that, or even if she doesn't see it because I'm on the phone, that affects my tone, and my tone causes her to interpret that I'm asking that question because I'm concerned for her situation. When she feels I'm concerned, she's way more inclined to what? Open up and tell me what's holding her back from, notice how I didn't say, what's really holding you back from signing up with me? <laughs> I said the end result. What's really holding you back from moving forward so you can make more money for your family? Notice how I'm putting in the end result of starting the business with you to make more money for the family. See what I'm doing there? I'm getting them into results-based thinking. You with me on that? All right. All right, here's what we went over. Three steps to becoming the trusted authority in your prospect's mind. Becoming a problem finder and solver, not a product pusher, that's no bueno. Number two, asking the right questions, but at the right time. Give you a few examples of the right tone and then eliminating sales resistance. All right, now. You guys want this book? Here is the thing. I think a lot of you had it because I've signed a lot of books. I will do my best to sign your book while I'm here. I do have to get a flight late tonight, but I will do my best. So what we're gonna do, does anybody want those slides? I told, um, I, I, I told some people I would do this for you. So what I'm gonna do, if you want the book, that's at Barnes & Noble. You can buy it from Barnes & Noble. That's the link, do not buy it from Amazon. If I find out you bought it from Amazon, I'm not signing it. So you better not tell me. We have a big deal with Barnes & Noble. So it's like 50 more cents at Barnes and Noble. So if you need a GoFundMe link to get the $17 so you can sell more to make more money, let us know, we'll get you a GoFundMe link. But there's the thing, I'm gonna give it up 10 seconds. Now, what you're gonna do is take a picture of you reading the book or the receipt and on Instagram, you can follow me on IG. If you tag me in the stories, my team will send those slides to you. We'll just send them to you. Will that help? Yeah. Okay, but you got to do that, otherwise I'm not sending them to you. Okay, because I'm here on a Sunday. What's going on? Okay, now, remember, I want to go over this last quote that changed everything for me. And it can change everything for you, because right now this is just a start of what we're going to do. Remember what Tony said. You will fail for the simple reason you don't learn the right skills. 
Who has con complete control of acquiring the right skills? You do. Take control of your business, of your financial situation, and develop the right skills. Because what is the biggest expense in your life right now? What is your biggest expense in your life? Is it your mortgage? Is it your taxes? Is it all that? Well, those are expenses, but your biggest expense in life is your lack of knowledge. Your biggest expense in life right now that you have is your lack of knowledge of not knowing the right questions, not knowing the right things to say, not understanding how to use your tone to help you make at least what? Does everybody want to make at least 350000 a year in this business? Yeah. 500000 See, that's your biggest expense right now. That's your biggest expense in life that you have. So once you acquire those skills, what becomes possible? Everything. Okay. Thanks, everybody.